Hello, I'd like to welcome you all to the 18th annual Swartz Mind Brain Lecture. I'm Lorna Roll, the Chair of Neurobiology and Behavior, um, which hosts this wonderful occasion every year. Um, it's funded by the Swartz Foundation, which was established in 1994 to explore the application of physics and mathematics and engineering to fundamental aspects and questions in, in neuroscience. The Swartz Mind Brain Lectureship was set up only a few years later in 1997 with the idea to bring the Stony Brook community at large together with distinguished neuroscientists in order to learn about and explore aspects of, of brain science. Jerry Swartz, who's the head of the Swartz Foundation and the uh, donor who makes this lecture possible, um, was the co-founder of Symbol Technologies. He's credited with over 200 patents, is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, and a trustee of the Stony Brook Foundation. And we think his greatest gift is this lecture series, um, which has been going for 18 years. So this year, the Swartz Mind Brain Lecture is Dr. Bill Newsom. Bill is broadly interested in how we make simple, visual-based decisions. Every day we make decisions, and we make them based on what we see, what we perceive that we are seeing, um, and why we are looking in the first place. And a classic example of this sort of performance um, that, that I think conveys it, uh, or a common decision-making task, is, is if you think about the circumstance of coming to the side of a busy street and you need to make a decision um, that either involves perhaps crossing that street or perhaps what you're doing instead is hailing a cab. So those are two very different sorts of contexts for the decision and in one situation you would attend to the flow of the traffic in order to hopefully find a moment when you could get across and in the other you'd be looking for the yellow cars and in particular, the ones that had the little light on that they were actually available. So Professor Newsom has been a leader in understanding really what the underlying mechanisms are in the brain that subserve these so-called simple um, types of decision-making processes. He's also very interested in how motivation and reward might influence this, this process. He has a very uh, illustrious CV. Um, beginning in particular uh, as an assistant professor in the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at SUNY Stony Brook. <laughs> so he was here from 1984 to 1988, and I would say one of our biggest sadnesses was the fact that we lost him uh, to Stanford. He went to Stanford University in 1988, and he has been there ever since in the Department of Neurobiology and has climbed the ladder, of course, from assistant professor to full to now chaired and provostial professor. He has had numerous awards, but they're not, I, I, I would like to mention a few. Um, he started out with the, the Sloan and, and McKnight Awards, and then after many more, uh, in 1994 got the Alden Spencer Award, and in 1997 was named as an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, he then began the 21st century with a bang. Uh, in 2000, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences and continued to receive awards, including one for outstanding service to graduate students at Stanford University. So this is a man who really has contributed in, in multiple domains to uh, the academic and educational mission as well. He's been awarded the Dan David Prize in Tel Aviv, the Carl Spencer Lashley Award, and he was elected to membership also of the American Philosophical Society in 2011. In 2012, he was given an honorary degree by SUNY School of Optometry, so I think we need to get, get on board here. Um, his list of well over 100 publications serves as really an exemplar of the highest quality work in the highest quality journals. Nature, Science, Journal of Neuroscience, Journal of Neurophysiology, Nature Neuroscience, it's, it's really extremely impressive. He's been named as a distinguished uh, lecturer more than 30 times um, worldwide, so he's quite accustomed to speaking, um, from everything from the University College London, where he gave the Sherrington, and the Sherrington Lecture at Oxford University, the Milner Lecture at McGill, uh, the Institute for Molecular Pathology in Vienna, and the most far-flung, 
for the Australian Neurosciences Society in Tasmania. He said that was a great trip. Within the U.S., he's been invited as distinguished lecturer at Harvard three times, Princeton, Brandeis, UPenn, and finally Stony Brook um, for the Swartz Mind Brain Lecture. His current titles are that he is the Harmon Family Provostial Professor at Stanford. He is the professor in the Department of Neurobiology at Stanford. He is the director of the Neurosciences Institute at Stanford. And at the moment, he is also co-chair of the NIH Brain Advisory Committee for President Obama's Brain Initiative. His lecture today has been retitled, so I'll get it right, Perceiving and Deciding from Single Neurons to Dynamical Systems, Bill. So all of those uh, distinctions and awards and lectures, you know, lead up. I'm finally invited back to Stony Brook for a distinguished lecture. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be back here. As Lauren said, this is where I started my uh, academic career as an assistant professor, and I've really enjoyed over the last 24 hours renewing acquaintances with some old friends and making new friends. It's also particularly a pleasure for me to speak at the Swartz Lecture, because Jerry Swartz, I admire him. He has been you know, one of the most vocal um, proponents of this sort of confluence of quantitative science and neuroscience, the study of the brain that has occupied virtually my entire career, and it's a real honor for me to be here and honor Jerry with this. Um, I apologize because I have a cold, so if I sound like I'm talking through a thick, heavy blanket, it's because I am. But um, I think we'll do okay. I think my vocal cords have kept reasonably clear and we'll make it here. Uh, so my students always tell me that I should start out a lecture, any lecture that I give with a big picture. And um, we'll start out here with the big picture. And the big picture is you're here. Uh, so this is the confluence of physics and biology. And the, the salient fact to note here is that anything you know about your universe comes through this three pounds of matter sitting inside your head. And of course, any action you take upon your world similarly originates in your head and comes back out onto the world. And uh, the importance of the brain cannot be overstated. Uh, I've, I'm fond of pointing out to audiences who tell me, well, it's no more important than the heart or the kidney or whatever. I'm fond of pointing out to audiences that the, a brain transplant would be the only transplant surgery in which you'd prefer to be the donor rather than the recipient. Okay, just think about that for a minute to you know, come to you. So Michelangelo uh, recognized the importance of the brain. Uh, how many of you seen this in the Sistine Chapel ceiling? Um, how many of you noticed that God is speaking out of a brain up here? You can see the cerebellum here and the brain stem and the pons. So uh, it's a little bit doctored, but I'm sure Michelangelo realized the importance of the brain. Uh, this is a macaque monkey. Uh, it's an animal that we work with extensively in my laboratory. All the data that I'll tell you about today are obtained from awake behaving monkeys uh, who are trained to do various kinds of visual discriminations that I'll tell you a little bit about. And this is the cerebral hemisphere of a macaque monkey. It's uh, an animation from Jonathan Horton's lab at UCSF. This is the cerebral cortex, which is the organ of sort of thinking and conscious perception that wraps around the outside of your brain. And the cerebral cortex, even though it has all of these folds and dimples in it that you're familiar with, is actually a flattened sheet, as you can see here, as it unfolds uh, across time. And at some point, there's intrinsic curvature, and you introduce this little slit up here, and you introduce another slit here to relieve some of the stress of curvature. But fundamentally, you can take the cerebral cortex out and, and make a large sheet of it. And that's very impressive, right, how much cortex there is starting out from that rather small cerebral hemisphere of a macaque monkey. And neurophysiologists and neuroscientists have been studying this cortex uh, for a long time. And here's a flattened version that comes from David Van Essen's lab. Uh, and the uh, sort of magenta areas back here are the visual areas of the cerebral cortex. You can see they're connected to the two retinae back here. Uh, there's some somat various somatosensory and motor areas. This is the prefrontal cortex that uh, we'll talk about later in the talk. Uh, but the visual cortex is huge. I mean, primates are predominantly visual animals. 
And um, this is a different form of that map. This shows that the actual anatomical connections between the areas. So this is V1, the primary visual area to which the eyes actually project via the thalamus. And this is uh, uh, an area that I'll have a lot to say about this evening is, uh, is the motion sensing area or or MT, uh, which I don't see up there at the moment. Oh, there it is, right there. Okay, MT. We'll have a lot to say about MT in just a few moments. But this, this sort of hierarchy of visual areas has uh, been a really interesting m uh, mystery and a foundational sort of principle of organization for people who've studied vision. And that's been sort of the driving question that, is, that has been behind my research now for several decades, which is how does electrical activity uh, mere popping of neurons in these visual areas of the brain enable us to see, enable this sort of conscious experience of the visual world that we have. And um, you'll see that we get to some pretty interesting places when we start studying this with the tools of neurophysiology. So um, psychologists, at the same time neurobiologists, were discovering this, these things about the visual system. Perceptual psychologists uh, have understood that there are certain primitives in visions, things like motion and color and orientation and binocular disparity, which are cues to depth, that uh, is what we call early vision. And then high-level vision happens up here with this mysterious more processing and still more processing. Uh, but it was very tempting at times, you know, to sort of try to map these primitives in particular one-to-one -one on some of these areas. And I can tell you right now that that was, we spent about 10 to 15 years going in the wrong direction on that. They don't map one-to-one, -one, with perhaps one exception where it comes close, and that's motion vision, mapping sort of one-to-one -one nearly onto this area, MT and MST, out here in the, in the, in the uh, parietal lobe, and it was the one that I had the good fortune to sort of stumble on as a postdoc and start investigating seriously when I came here to Stony Brook, and I'll, I'll tell you guys a little bit about that historically. Now, for those of you who don't know much about neurophysiology, the cerebral cortex here, if you just take a little slice out of it and stain it for nissel substance so each purple dot becomes a cell body, you can see that under one square millimeter of cortex, there are a lot of cells. There's usually about oh, anywhere between 10 and 100,000 single cells, and they're arranged in these layers. And these layers have to do with the inputs and outputs from the cortex. And our main instrument for studying these cells has been the microelectrode, which is a very tiny uh, strip of tungsten that's insulated down to its tip. And if this tip gets snuggled up against one of these cells closely enough, you can actually record the electrical impulses, the action potentials that are emitted by single cells without being too troubled by noise introduced by neighboring cells. And these action potentials, they last less than a millisecond, and they're the primary uh, coin. They're the coin of the realm in the brain. They're the primary mode of information transfer from one cell to the next cell inside the brain. And a lot of our studies have to do with monitoring the action potentials of these cells while an animal is doing some intelligent task and trying to figure out how the traffic of action potentials has to do with the intelligent task that the animal is working on. Now, this is an early recording from 1968 by Hubel and Weasel, a really fundamental discovery that they made about a property in the visual cortex called orientation selectivity. And you do not see this property in the retina. And what they fundamentally discovered is that if you take an oriented bar, uh, here's a particularly good orientation, and you sweep it back and forth across the region of the retina that the cell in the cortex really cares about, you get these uh, action potentials. You can get bursts of action potentials. Every little vertical tick mark here is an action potential. And this orientation elicits a lot of action potentials out of the cell. But if you change the orientation just slightly on either side of the optimal, you get very few action potentials. And you change the orientation a little bit more, you get even fewer. And you make the orientation orthogonal to the prefer preferred orientation, and you get no responses at all out of the cell. And you do not see these kinds of cells in the retina, and it's obviously a creation of the wiring between the retina and the cortex, which of course gives you the idea that these cells uh, must be some very important building block of perception. Now, here's another kind of cell. This is from the work of John Mansell and David Van Essen in 1983. This is a motion-sensitive cell. It has a property that we call direction selectivity. 
And what John and David did was simply take a bar, like one of Hubel's bars, and they would move the bar through the receptive field of the cell in eight different directions. And these histograms here, and again, we're just plotting action potentials as a function of time. Uh, you can see that when they moved the bar down and to the left, there was this slew of action potentials elicited. You move that same bar up and to the right, and there's almost nothing. And you have, again, this nice tuning curve for direction of motion. And Orientation selective cells make up about 90, 95% of the cells in V1, that first visual area. But this other visual area, MT, that I spent a lot of time studying here at Stony Brook and at Stanford, is it has very little orientation selectivity and instead has about 90% of these direction selective cells, which gives the hint that this area is very important for seeing motion. And I'm going to show you a little movie of an orientation cell. What you're going to see, this camera is sitting right next to the monkey's head. So the monkey comes out. He's in a monkey chair. He does this every day. He plays little video games for us until he's uh, not tired of it, any, until he's tired of it. Uh, he gets, for a correct reward, and I'll tell you about the task he's playing, uh, he gets shots of some preferred juice that he likes into his mouth, and he'll work until he's not thirsty anymore, and then he'll stop, and the experiment's over. And here, uh, the, the animal, is, uh, I should give you a little more introduction. Here, the camera is by the animal's head, and you're looking at the TV screen that the animal is looking at, and you're going to see these random dot patterns come on, and they'll move in eight different directions. And the soundtrack that you hear, the pop, 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 that noise stuff you just heard there, those are the recordings of action potentials. So the action potentials are recorded by the electrode, they're amplified, they're played out over sound meter. And you'll be able to listen to the action potential discharge associated with eight different directions of motion. And you'll just be able to hear the preferred direction and the null direction. Uh, it'll be quite obvious to you. So that was a pretty good response, right? Down to the left. Not as vigorous for straight down. Less vigorous for down and to the right. Pretty pathetic directly to the right. And listen to that. Complete inhibition up and to the right. Puny straight up. Now we're coming back up to the left. You can hear the response increasing. Big response here. Now we're back in this direction. And it sounds like a machine gun. So that illustrates the property. I mean, when the animal's actually looking at those dots and seeing them, this illustrates this property of direction selectivity. And uh, the preferred direction, I'm going to have recourse to this term later in the talk, the preferred direction of that particular cell was down and to the left, and its null direction, where it went completely quiet, was up and to the right. And we'll talk about preferred and null directions here for the next few moments. So these discoveries started being made. You could see by the dates on some of those things. This is in the 70s and the 1980s. And this is a paper from the, the journal Perception in 1972. It's an extraordinarily influential paper in my field uh, by this guy, Horace Barlow, who is a sensory physiologist at Cambridge. And um, it's called Single Units and Sensation, a Neuron Doctrine for Perceptual Psychology? And Horace listed five doctrines that became the field of a couple of decades, the, the foundation of a couple of decades of research. And the most important one that I want to call your attention to is down here. It's number four. And this was the assertion that perception corresponds. Now, he's, he's talking about here perception, right? Uh, how psychology maps on to physiology. Perception corresponds to the activity of a small selection from the very numerous high-level neurons, each of which corresponds to a pattern of external events of the order of complexity um, of the events symbolized by a word or by visual icon, as he, dis as he discussed later in the paper. But the fundamental notion is that the, is that the firing patterns of individual cells in the brain tell you something important about the role that they're playing in perception. So a direction-selective cell gives you a strong hint, according to Barlow's doctrine, that that cell is important for seeing motion. Now, that's a huge leap, right? That's a leap across the mind-brain barrier. It's really about how physiology gets linked to psychology. And we sort of, no one knew, there was no direct evidence for that kind of link when we started doing our experiments at Stony Brook back in the 1980s, uh, 1984 to be exact. And so we set out to actually try to test this, to try to imagine some, some experiments that we could do to see, are these cells really at the bottom of, of what this monkey uses when he judges direction of motion? 
So here's the macaque cerebral hemisphere again, front part of the brain, back part of the brain. Here's the primary visual cortex, and here's this area MT that I've already alluded to, where about 90% of the cells have this property of direction selectivity. And we trained monkeys to tell us the direction of motion that they were seeing in these random dot patterns. And sometimes the random dot patterns would be really strong and, and the discrimination's trivially easy for the animal. And at sometimes it'd be, it'd be hard, so there'd be noise dots in here as well as these signal dots. And sometimes the motion is completely random and it's very difficult for the monkey or for humans to make any sense of it at all. And, um, this is, these are my colleagues at the time. That's me from 1989, right about the time I was, I, I was at Stony Brook. Some of you in the audience know Ken Britton. He was a graduate student here at Stony Brook at the time and uh, uh, was my first postdoc, actually. This is Mike Shadlin, who was a postdoc in my lab, Dan Salzman, and this is my colleague, Tony Mobshin. Most of you know him at NYU. Some of you do, and you'll see this little movie here. This is utterly Tony from being respectable in 1996 to being an irrespectable graduate student in 1976. And that's <laughs> totally Tony for those of you who don't know him. Um, so here's, here's what we train the monkey to do. And you're going to do what the monkeys do. And what you're going to see is a little yellow dot come on up here, and I want you to stare at the yellow dot. And while you're looking at the yellow dot, there's gonna be this circular aperture with motion coming on, and you're simply to tell me what direction of motion you see, whether you see rightward motion or leftward motion. So stare at the dot and tell me, just yell. What do you see? Right, easy, easy, right? So this is 100% coherence. All of those dots are carrying a rightward motion signal. Now here we're going down to 60%, okay, and do the same trick. What direction do you see? Yep, so you, you were a little quieter that time, took you a little longer, but basically you all got it. Here's 40%, what direction do you see? Yep, good, it's good monkeys, okay? <laughs> and here's 30%, it starts getting a little bit tougher here at 30%, but tell me, tell me what direction you see, right? That's good, so you're still getting it correct, but you're being a little more slow about it. Here's 20%, tougher, direction? Yep, we've got a lot of lefts here. All right, 10%, how are we doing at 10%? What direction? Yes, we have a yes, we have some rights and lefts and ups and downs. I'll give you another shot, here's 10%. Again, what direction do you see? Yeah, I, th I think the first one was right and the second one was left. I'm not 100% sure about that. <coughs> Excuse me. But you get the picture here, right? I mean, you can't win. We can keep lowering this coherence. And what we're doing is we're doing a psychophysical experiment. We're measuring a psychophysical threshold. We're measuring the sensitivity of your visual system to direction of motion, right? And we can take that down and we can take lots of measurements from you and we can very precisely uh, measure your ability to do that. So uh, the first experiment that we did here at Stony Brook was actually um, measure monkeys performing this task and we characterize their perceptual sensitivity using exactly what we just did with you. But at the same time, we recorded from these MT neurons. Now think about the MT neuron you, show, you showed. Remember it had a, that you saw, it had, a, it had a strong motion preference for motion down and to the left and it didn't like motion up and to the right very much. But I think you can imagine that if we start taking down the coherence of that stimulus, right, making it more and more difficult to see, it'll also make it more and more difficult for that neuron to discriminate between the preferred direction and the null direction. And we can characterize the neuron sensitivity at the same time on the exact same trials that we're char characterizing the monkey's sensitivity. And the way we do that is like this. The monkey looks at the television screen. He's required to look at this fixation point. Uh, he's sitting in a little apparatus that allows us to measure his fixation position. And he tells us he's ready to roll by studying the fixation point the same way you stared at the yellow one. Now the MT cell has a receptive field, a little part of the retina that it's particularly responsive to, and we mapped that out ahead of time. We know where that is. We also know the MT cell's direction selectivity. In this case, this cell had a preferred direction up and to the right, so we call that the preferred direction, and then its null direction was down and to the left. So the monkey fixates here, and while he's fixating, we show the motion, either up and to the right in the preferred direction or down and to the left in the null direction uh, for one second. 
So he gets to look at it for one second while he holds his eyes here. If he ever tries to sneak a direct peek out there, the computer realizes it and it aborts the trial and he, the monkey does not get any reward. So he's motivated to keep his eyes here and then he sees the stimulus sort of peripherally and if he thinks that the motion was up and to the right when he gets permission, and the permission is the disappearance of the fixation point, if he thought the motion was up and to the right, he simply flips his eyes to this target. And if he thought the motion was down and to the left, he simply flips his eyes to this target. So the monkey's just flipping his eyes from one target to the other to tell us what direction of motion he sees. And of course, we know what we put up there. We put some easy trials up there, we put some hard trials up there, we put some up and to the right trials, some down and to the left, and we can build beautiful curves that capture the monkey's sensitivity, and at the same time, we're recording the responses of the neurons. And what this slide shows you is six different experiments. All of these were conducted over there in the basement of the Life Sciences uh, Research Building here. And the open circles actually show you the monkey's psychophysical performance. So this shows you the proportion correct, so 1.0 would be 100% correct. 0.5 is chance, that's 50% correct. There's only two directions of motion, and you're gonna get 50% correct just by chance. And so for six different experiments, those open circles show you the sensitivity of the monkey to the motion uh, uh, trials. Now the black circles show you the sensitivity of the cell that we recorded out of the cerebral cortex on the same six experiments. And you can see that some of these cells are beautifully sensitive. They are just as sensitive as the monkey is psychophysically. Uh, some of these cells are really very, very poor. If the monkey were just relying on this cell, he wouldn't do nearly as well as he in fact did. And occasionally we see the surprising cell that's actually somewhat better than the monkey. And we went through lots of extensive modeling experiments to try to understand exactly how the, 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 the uh, sensitivity of the cell was related to the sensitivity of the monkey. But you know, when, you, when we did a lot of these kinds of experiments and we just took the ratio of the cell to the monkey's perceptual sensitivity across about 300 cells, uh, we had a ratio dead on, spot on one which sort of suggests that, okay, at, at the very least, the information is present in this population of cells that the monkey needs in order to make this judgment. Now that shows us that the information is correct, but it doesn't necessarily show us that the monkey uses that information, and that's kind of the next experiment we did. But I wanna take a little side trip here. I wanna show you something. This is a historical artifact. I've never shown this before. Uh, the way that these so-called neurometric functions, these black ones, the ones that characterize the sensitivity of the neuron, the way that they're built is through a method from signal detection theory called ROC analysis. And some of you in the room I know know what an ROC curve is. And Ken and I, we, 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 when we first started getting these data, we were so eager to build these neurometric functions, we actually went and plotted these ROC curves on graph paper by hand. Uh, so we had the first Sun workstation in the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at the time, but we weren't very good at programming it. So we actually plotted these ROC curves, and when you plot the ROC curves, this is sort of false positives against correct detections, and you plot it for all of the different motion coherences, the area under the ROC curve is important because it corresponds to the percent correct that an ideal observer would get if all he had was one trial, one spike count from one trial, say 69 spikes occurred on that particular trial, was that motion in the preferred direction or the null direction? And uh, for a shallow ROC curve, the area under the curve is about half of this unit triangle, so it'd be 50% correct. And for a steep one up here, the monkey, the ideal observer would be almost 100% correct. And uh, we did not, we didn't, we weren't, as I said, we weren't very good programmers, but we wanted to plot these ROC curves, as, so the proportion correct of the ideal observer. So to get these integrated areas, what we did was do a bunch of these by hand, and then we cut these things out with scissors, and we weighed the pieces of paper on a Mettler scale. And that's how we plotted the integrated area under the curve. So we, we weren't good programmers, but we at least understood integration, right? So, okay. So here, I mean, this was a killer experiment. This, this, this was an experiment in my mind's eye when I was at Stony Brook, but these experiments didn't actually get done until I was at Stanford. And what we reasoned is that, all right, well, I mean, we've got the information down here. The monkey's really good at this task. The information is sitting here in these cells. What happens if we go in and actually electrically stimulate these cells? So while the monkey is looking, he's trying to decide, especially on tough trials, is that, is that motion to the right or is it to the left? Is it up or is it down? 
And what if instead of using the electrode to listen to the cells, we use the electrode to pass little electrical stimulation currents and activate the cells artificially while the monkey's performing a tough discrimination. So we wanted to activate the up cells or the down cells or the right cells or the left cells. And we were actually helped in this because MT has what we call a columnar or patchy organization. So this is looking down at MT from the top. It's about 10 millimeters in this dimension. It's about the size of your thumbnail. It's about 10 millimeters in this dimension, about seven or eight millimeters in this dimension. And this was a two deoxyglucose imaging experiment where all of the up patches, patches of up cells were uh, come out in green and all of the down cells come out in red. And you can see that there are these patches of about half a millimeter or so that are clusters of up cells and down cells. So we would just put microelectrodes in the middle of one of these patches and then uh, we would have the monkey do the task and on half the trials we would withhold stimulation and let the monkey do it the way he normally does with his brain. And on half the trials we would stimulate one of these columns with very weak stimulation currents, a millionth of an am ampere. And here's the results from one of the experiments. So this, is, this shows you now, this is, this is different from what I showed you previously. This is not percent correct. This is the proportion of choices the monkey made in the preferred direction. So if up is the preferred direction, this shows you the proportion of times he chose up. And 0% coherence, so that's the totally random motion is in the middle. And you can see that at 0% coherence, he's up here, I don't know, he's got some bias, but he's making 50 or 60% of his choices up. For strong motion, he's saying up almost 100% of the time. And for strong motion to the left, he's saying, mo he's saying up nearly 0% of the time. So this is when, he, we, when we stimulated him, and this is when we did not stimulate him. And all of these are coming in random order in the same experiment. And what you can see is that when we stimulated, he had a tendency to say up more often than when we did not stimulate him. So stimulating the up column caused him to make more upward judgments. And here, so here we're really manipulating the circuit and showing behavioral change. And this was a very consistent result. So this was four more example experiments. And we did this dozens and dozens of times. And this was how we really showed that uh, when the monkey makes these judgments, he's really leaning on these cells. And so Horace Barlow is looking really good at this time, right? I mean, this, you would not expect this from a digital computer, that you could take the back off a digital computer, go in and find one transistor, see something about what it's doing, and then stimulate that one transistor and get something intelligible out of the behavior of the machine. This tells you that brains are built on somewhat different principles. At least early visual systems are built on different principles than digital computers. So there was always one $64,000 question that I you know, have been frustrated over the years because we've never been able to answer. And, and the question is, what does the monkey actually see when we stimulate MT? And there are two possible answers to this. If that monkey could talk to us, right? And, and I have to tell you, we only ever reward the animal for the objectively correct answer. So for example, if the motion is down, but we stimulate an up column, and he says up. We don't reward him for that. He has all the motivation in the world to get the objectively correct answer. And if he, he could be saying to himself, aha, they're doing it to me now, right? Even if I see up, I'm gonna answer down instead because I know better, right? But so we only ever stimulate him for giving the correct answer. Uh, so there are two things he could tell us. I mean, if, if he, we stimulate an up column and he said up, but the real answer was down, he could say to us, listen guys, I saw upward motion on that trial and I said upward motion, why didn't you reward me? You're not playing fair, okay? But another thing he could say to us is, you know, I saw downward motion on that trial, but I reported up. I, ha I don't know why the hell I did that. And we all know that, right? You, uh, you walk out of a test and you put the wrong answer down on some question, you say, why did I do that? I knew what the answer to that was. So it's, it's really a question about what is the conscious experience that accompanies activity at some different particular point in the brain. Were we really changing that animal's conscious experience of the visual world, or were we intervening at some decision level uh, that was apart from the actual primary conscious experience? And I don't know a way to answer that question in monkeys. I mean, there's some indirect things we can imagine, but I don't know any direct way to ask that because the monkey can't interact with me verbally the way one of you could if you're in my lab. 
So I'm on the record of, as having, want, I want my MT stimulated because I want to know the answer to that, to that question. And I've actually talked with a couple of neurosurgeons about that. Um, probably could not get that through the IRB, uh, human subjects protocol, at least not in the US, though I've had some people tell me I could if I went to some other countries. Uh, I might, might, might consider it. I'm not sure how much I want to know the answer to that question, but I'm deeply curious about the answer to this question. So um, the next thing we did sort of following our noses, and this is through the 1990s and into the early 2000s, we said, well, what comes after MT? I mean, you can think about MT as having evidence. Uh, it's like the evidence getting presented at a trial, and every ne MT neuron is voting for how much of its favorite stuff does it see. So the up neurons are saying, well, I see X amount of my favorite up stuff. And the down neurons are saying, well, I see Y amount of my favorite down stuff. And we had to postulate a likely decision process and the calculation of a decision variable because ultimately the monkey's rendering binary judgments by the structure of our task, right? So he's got to weigh the evidence but then render a judgment like a jury renders a judgment, you know, guilty versus innocent. The monkey's got to render a judgment up versus down based on the evidence. And we wanted to ask some questions about, well, what is that decision mechanism? So what are the neural circuits that actually sample the evidence and actually render a decision, a choice? And we spent several years studying this, and Mike Shadlin, who started this work with me uh, at Stanford, went on and did the most brilliant work on this, and I understand he's been a Swartz lecturer before me several years ago, so some of you may have heard him there. Um, and here's, here's the basic uh, little twist that you need to appreciate to see, understand the little movies you're about to see. So the monkey, it starts as usual, he fixates his fixation point. In this example, he sees motion either right or to the left. And then after the, after the dots are on here, there's this little delay period of about a half a second to a thousand milliseconds where the dots disappear and the monkey's just sitting there in darkness and the two targets are here. He knows he's gonna make his eye movement here if he saw rightward motion. He's gonna make his eye movement here if he saw leftward motion. Uh, but he's in the dark. There's no visual evidence here and he's just remembering uh, you know, what he saw and planning his coming eye movement. And then when the fixation point disappears, he goes ahead and makes the eye movement. And the remarkable thing was when we started recording in some of these higher areas, uh, like uh, here, the parietal lobe, area LIP in the parietal lobe, or since we've done this, Mike's lab and my lab have both done this in the prefrontal cortex, as well as in some subcortical structures like the superior colliculus, the remarkable thing is that we saw, we discovered cells that correlated with the animal's decision independently of the evidence that came in the eye. And you can see that most strikingly on trials where the motion really is truly random. You know, those dots are going in all random directions, but the monkey will go ahead and take a guess because he's got a 50-50 chance of giving him a reward. So even when there's no correct answer, we'll give him a reward with a probability of 50-50. So he'll go ahead and take his best shot. And it turns out that by listening to these cells up here in the parietal lobe and the frontal lobe, you can actually get a window onto the monkey's decision process. You can tell by listening to the c these cells which way he's getting ready to go. So in this example here, he sees downward motion and he makes an eye movement down. And I'm gonna play that for you again. So you, you can see this little hovering dot of light, and that's his eye position. So you'll see where the monkey's eye is pointed, and then you'll see the random dots come on, and in this case, they, they're pointed down, so the monkey starts planning this downward eye movement. And you'll see the random dots go off before he actually gets permission to make that eye movement, but the cell's firing at a very high firing rate, and you can tell he's getting ready to make a downward eye movement. So let's look at this one more time. So here's his eye. Well, that was the next one. <laughs> I fooled you. All right, let's go look at it one more time. Here's the downward. It's a strong firing rate, and he went down. And here's a weaker firing rate, and he goes up. And here's another example of a strong firing rate, and he goes down. And even in that gap, after the stimulus is turned off, you can actually tell which way he's going. 
And Mike's lab and my lab, this, this figure here comes from Mike's lab, have done a lot of analysis of cells like this. And if we just plot those firing rates, so you're hearing the firing rates with your ear, but if we just measure them and plot them, uh, we can plot them for lots of different trials. And whenever the monkey decides a particular direction of motion that's the favorite direction for that, or predictor uh, decision, which is a, the favored decision for that cell, we get increases in firing rates through the trial. And when the monkey decides the non-preferred decision for that cell, we get these decreased firing rates through the trial. And furthermore, these firing rates sort out nicely depending on how strong the evidence was. So this is not only a record of the animal's decision forming in his brain, but it's a record of the strength of the evidence that led to that decision, which is a real signature of a decision process. And this is very familiar to any of you who are psychologists, and you know that you like to ask human subjects to make decisions, but then attach a rating or a confidence rating to it. And, and confidence is a very strong indicator of a decision process. And Rizbe, Kiani, and Mike have gone on to show that these neural correlates here, these graded correlates by coherence, correspond to the animal's confidence with which he's making one decision or the other, and it's a very beautiful story. So Horace Barlow is looking good to us right now, right? He's, he's this, this sort of thing that the individual cells give you some clue about the role that cells play in perception, or even now, as we've seen in decision making, uh, it looks like maybe we can go through the whole brain here and we can just keep recording cell by cell and get through the decisions and motor output and maybe, maybe this is ultimately the way to understand you know, the brain. But we have run up recently on a situation where this strategy has failed us and failed us pretty dramatically and this has been a huge learning lesson for me over the last seven or eight years. This is a paper that we published recently in Nature, last November, and this is the paper that Laura, Lorna alluded to a little bit earlier, where we're looking at context dependence of decisions. So this is called context-dependent computation by recurrent dynamics in prefrontal cortex, and let me unpack that formidable sounding title for you. This work was done by Valerio Manti and David Cicillo, both postdocs at Stanford, both great guys. And here's an example of what we mean by context-dependent decision-making. So the monkey's gonna be looking at these dots again, but he's gonna have two different contexts. The dots have two properties. They have motion to the right or motion to the left, just like the movies you've already seen. But you can see now they have this color property as also. Some of the color is green, some of the dots are green, and some of the dots are red. And in context one, that's signaled by a yellow fixation point, that's the motion context, and the animal is, is instructed, that instructs the animal to report the direction of motion that he sees and completely ignore the color. So in this example, if motion is to the right, at the end of the trial, the monkey would get rewarded for making an eye movement to this target, showing that it's rightward motion. But in the color context, signaled by a blue fixation point, if the motion is to the right, uh, he is supposed to make an eye movement to the target that corresponds to the dominant color in the random dot pattern. So he ignores the motion here, and you guys can see that most of these dots are green, which means he's going to get rewarded for making an eye movement to the green target. Poor animal, right? These, these shifty experimenters. And again, here's a movie, and you can tell me, this is an easy one, but you can tell me, this is motion context, and you're supposed to tell me the direction of motion, just ignore the color, and you see that that is rightward motion. That's pretty easy. I've deliberately made these easy for you. And here, you are supposed to tell me the color and ignore the motion. And the predominant color is exactly. Okay, so the animal does this thing, and he, he does it at psychophysical threshold, so we can, again, we can make this easy or we can make this difficult, and we move him from context to context. And this slide shows you our logic. This shows you the question we were really after. So we knew already that the motion signals for this task, when he's in the motion context, the motion signals come out of MT, right? That's, that's what we spent 10, 15 years showing in gory detail. We did not show this in as much as detail, but we have good reason to believe that in the color context, these color signals are coming out of the so-called ventral visual pathway, a couple of areas named V4 and IT. That's never been really nailed the way we've nailed motion in the dorsal pathway, but it's a really good hypothesis. And both of these sort of streams of visual evidence have projections into these decision areas that Mike and I each have spent 10 or 15 years studying, including the parietal lobe, the lateral intraparietal area, 
the prefrontal cortex and the midbrain, the superior colliculus. And what we expected to see, the, way, the reason we designed this experiment is we wanted to see gating in action. So our hypothesis was that when the, motion, when the monkey was in the motion context, that these motion signals would hit the decision circuits and be integrated a function of time according to Mike's beautiful model, and the color signals would not hit these decision circuits at all. I mean, if you're in a motion context and you're getting your reward for reporting motion, then this color is only going to confuse you, right? Uh, and similarly, we hypothesize that when the monkey's in the color context, that these color signals would hit the integrator circuits that are responsible for the decision, and this guy would get crossed out. So we had kind of a switching hypothesis here, and those of you who think about psychology and attentional filtering will recognize some similarity here to sort of attentional notions of filtering early signals out and only allowing the relevant signals to get into the decision circuitry. Now what we discovered, what Valeria and I discovered, much to our disappointment, is that we were totally dreadfully wrong about that. So in both contexts, the motion signals were hitting these decision circuits, as were the color signals, which ought to be a disaster, because sometimes the motion is signaling to the right, but the color is signaling the monkey to go left. How is he supposed to decide? Well, we know he can do this. We've measured the behavior, and I haven't shown you the behavioral data, but in fact, after several months of training, they're really good at this. So we know the monkey sorts those signals out, but how in the world could he do that? And we were puzzled about this for a couple of years until we started working with David Cicillo, who's a computational neuroscientist, trained with Larry Abbott at, at, um, at, in, at Columbia. And you know, this, this really brings to the fore, I think, why theory is so important in modern science, because the brain at some levels operates in a very nonlinear, very non-intuitive ways, and our intuitions fail us, and the only way to go forward is with proper quantitative theories and simulations. And David worked with a class of models called randomly connected recurrent neural networks. And David looked at Valerio's puzzling data and he said, you know, I think one of my RNNs, my, rec my recurrently connected neural networks, will solve this problem. They are set up to solve dynamical problems. So he spent a year of his time talking deeply with Valerio. They met every Friday morning together. And this is really, to my mind, one of the prime beautiful examples of computation and neuroscience coming together. So let me just describe a little bit to you about David's model here. The, the guts of David's model is 100 of these units inside, inside this recurrently connected loop. We're only showing you about 10 of them here, but there's 100 of them. And their connection weights with each other are all established initially randomly. Now, for those of you who know about network modeling, these are asymmetric. The fact that A is connected to B by weight X does not mean that B is connected back to A by weight X. All of these things are established randomly. And again, for those of you who know this stuff, this means we're into connection matrices that put us into non-normal dynamics. Those of you who don't follow that, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal right now. But those of you who do follow that, that foreshadows something that will come out in a moment. So this is this recurrently connected engine, and all of this feedback here means when you put in a pulse of input, you get lots of activity reverberating around here, lots of dynamics, and you can train those dynamics to do interesting tasks. So here's the deal. We mimicked the monkey's task. On every trial, we would put in a noisy motion signal, and again, it's randomly connected with random connection weights to each of these internal neurons, and at the same time, we would bring in this noisy color signal. This motion signal could be one of several values, depending on whether it was rightward motion or leftward motion, strong or weak, similarly for the color. Now, like the monkey, the model also gets this context signal, one and zero if the context is motion context, or zero and one if it's color context. And again, these are randomly connected in the beginning. And then we go through this network training process, and ultimately the network learns to integrate this activity toward plus one if the correct choice is to the right, and toward minus one if the correct choice is to the left, and the model learns to do the context dependence beautifully. And so it pays attention to the motion if, if, the, if the motion is, is the relevant context and to the color if the color is the relevant context. And then the question is, okay, this looks like a little piece of our prefrontal cortex and microcosm, and how the hell is it doing it? Maybe we can't figure it out for the millions and tens of million neurons in the prefrontal cortex right now, but at least for this little hundred neuron model, we ought to be able to figure it out. And David did figure it out, and the results were extremely revealing, and I do not have time to take it, 
take you through it step by step. But what I'll tell you is that as the model learns and it adjusts its network weights, it adjusts these connection weights in order to solve this problem, two dynamical features emerge from this model. And ultimately, the whole solution depends on these two dynamical features. And you have to plot the model's response in a reduced space that corresponds to color and choice and motion, where color is a certain pattern of, of, uh, of ratios of firing rates among those 100 units. Choice, the choice that the model makes is a different ratio among those 100 units, and the motion is yet a third ratio among those 100 units. So what we're plotting here is the strength of a particular ratio, all of the 100 units. So this is a response space, it's a reduced dimensionality response space, and I can tell you all about how we detect, how we identify these axes that are so important. But what happens is that David can then reverse engineer this model, and he discovered that in this space there are a series of what are called attractor points. And these are not there at the beginning, they're learned by the model, and each little red X is an attractor point. Now for those of you who don't know what an attractor point is, it is simply a ratio of all the firing rates of those 100 neurons that's stable. So if all of you guys linked arms, and legs, and you started pushing on each other with constant force, the center of mass of this whole room might move to the left or it might move to the right, but if everybody keeps their forces constant, we'll come into some kind of equilibrium, right? And that's an attractor state. And you can think of your pushing on each other as like synaptic weights, and you come into this attractor state, and it turns out that there are several of these things, and they form a line. And that line we call an approximate line attractor, and it is perfect for memory. It's perfect for integration, it's perfect for memory, because it means if the network gets to one of those points, it's gonna stay there, because it's stable, okay? And that's really critical. So David could then do these simulations, and he can put his network at one of these attractor points, because he can dial in any firing rates he wants to into these units, and then he can displace, he can perturb the network in the color direction. So we're in the color relevant context for the network, and he puts in a little pulse of color information in the color relevant context, and of course, the network is unstable out here. This is not a fixed point. You get out there, and somebody out there is pushing unfairly, and you're gonna relax back to the, to the line attractor, but you don't come back to the same place. You come back to a little point with, with sort of red input, a pulse of red input, you relax further along the attractor. And if you put in another pulse of red input, you relax further up along the tractor. And if you keep putting in pulses of red input, you simply keep moving this way along the tractor. In other words, you're integrating red input toward a choice to the right. And if we had been putting in green input, you would have gone this way and you would have integrated toward choice to the left. So that's the color input in the color relevant condition. But what happens if David puts in a pulse of motion information in the color relevant condition? And the answer is, you get out to another one of these unstable spaces, unstable points in the response space, you relax back to the line attractor, but you relax back to the exact same part where you started. And it doesn't matter how much motion you put in there, how many times you do this, you come back to the same spot. So in color relevant situations, the color is being integrated toward a choice, but the motion is not being integrated at all, it's being ignored. And all of this has to do with relaxation dynamics. So the big, secret here, the secret to this selective gating, how is it that the network gates and pays attention to the correct input and not the incorrect input? It's all about the relaxation dynamics. It's not about the initial pulse because the network is responding to both color and responding to motion just like the PFC neurons do, but it's this relaxation that determines which one's being remembered and which one's being ignored. So that is a really key insight here, that the computation, it's not Boolean algebra, the way our, our digital computers work, but it's selective gating and integration through dynamics, and they're part of the same dynamical process. So this has interesting implications, and the first one is that we've got extreme complexity at the single neuron level. When Valeria recorded in the frontal eye fields, the color and motion and choice signals were totally mixed up. But simplicity emerges at the population level when you start looking at patterns rather than single neurons. So now Barlow's not doing too well for us, right? Because the single neurons are leading us astray, but the patterns suddenly emerge simplicity. We know the directions in the state space where we get color and motion and choice. 
And then the selection and integration of this relevant information is, is accomplished through network dynamics. And it's two emergent features of the network that account, that are critical. And they account for the, uh, I'm sorry for the wording here, but these two emergent features of the network account for the dynamics. It's the line attractor and the relaxation dynamics. So just two features that you can characterize mathematically suddenly make this perplexing behavior comprehensible. And here's the real take home lesson from this part of the talk. So if you haven't followed all this in detail, that's fine. But here's the, here's the real take home lesson. There are these two emergent features. When you hook these neurons together in particular configurations and the neuron learns to cope with a dynamical task, it's these two features, the line attractor and the relaxation dynamics that account for the behavior. And these two concepts only make sense at the population level. An attractor does not exist at a single neuron level. The dynamics of relaxation don't exist at the single neuron level. It's only when you look at these populations hooked together in these feedback circuits that these features emerge. So now, instead of Horace Barlow, sort of the muse here is a guy named P.W. Anderson, and I'm sure that several of you have read this very famous paper that Anderson wrote about 20 years ago. And the name of the paper is More is Different, okay? He's a physicist, broken symmetry and the nature of hierarchical structure of science. And Anders, this, is worth, this is worth reading. The reductionist hypothesis may still be a topic of controversy among philosophers, but among the great majority of active science, I think it is accepted without question. The workings of our minds and bodies, and of all the animate or inanimate matter of which we have any detailed knowledge, are assumed to be controlled by the same set of fundamental laws which except under certain extreme conditions, we feel we know pretty well. And Anderson buys onto that. But where he goes and departs from that, he says the main fallacy in this kind of thinking is that the reductionist hypothesis does not by any means imply a constructionist philosophy. The ability to reduce everything to simple fundamental laws does not imply the ability to start from those laws and reconstruct the universe. So the dynamics of this network were not predictable from the properties of the individual neurons, but they became evident as the network was trained and learned individual connection weights in order to accomplish some particular task. So here now, I think we make a shift from Barlow to Anderson. And I'm looking back over 30 years of my career and I'm thinking, well, is how right is Barlow, even in early sensory areas? And maybe with some of these new ways of thinking about emergence and computation through dynamics, maybe we need to go back and re re revisit even these early visual areas. And I think that's an agenda of research over the next 10, 20 years and see how well it works. So I want to close just by talking a little bit about the Obama Brain Initiative that Lorna uh, alluded to. And I have a talk, actually, that I give about this, what's the deal with the Obama Brain Initiative. Uh, and I just, I think it's worthwhile to listen to just a little clip of Obama's speech back at the White House when he announced this about a year ago. I thought, I thought he was very moving about this. You know, as humans, we can identify galaxies light years away. We can study particles smaller than an atom, but we still haven't unlocked the mystery of the three pounds of matter that sits between our ears. So there, there's this enormous mystery uh, waiting to be unlocked. And the Brain Initiative will change that by giving scientists the tools they need to get a dynamic picture of the brain in action and better understand how we think and how we learn and how we remember. And that knowledge could be, will be, transformative. So regardless of what you think of President Obama, and regardless of what you think of pronouncements that come politically on a regular basis out of Washington, I think he got this right. I think the White House got this right. This is the right field at the right time. And the President alluded to one reason why it's the right field at the right time, and it's because we are developing, right at the moment, as we speak, new technological methods for accessing signals out of the brain and for understanding those signals that we've never had before. Many of us who've been in this business for 10, 20, 30, 40 years understand that we're at a time of revolutionary change and there is no way to predict what's gonna happen over the next 10 years except that it's gonna be interesting, okay? And 
uh, I'll give you just a little taste of, of one of these um, uh, new techniques that are allowing us now to record from, there's a paper published about eight months ago, recording from this little creature here, the larval zebrafish, and, which has the unique property, it's about two millimeters long, and it has the unique property of being transparent, it has transparent skin, so you can actually peer in and see the whole brain at once. And this animal was genetically modified so that each cell in the nervous system, which consists of about 100,000 cells, has calcium sensors in it. And every time a cell fires an action potential, calcium flows into the cell, and you get this little puff of fluorescence. And you're gonna see this animal's brain twinkle, twinkle, little star, where every neuron is puffing orange occasionally, and that's an indicator of every action potential. Now, you're only going to see one plane, and you're going to see this activity. This, this animal is gonna be completely stationary. He's totally alive. He's not anesthetized. He's stationary because he's in agar, you know, this uh, like jello that scientists put inside petri dishes. So he's stabilized so that through the microscope you can actually see the individual cells. And you're gonna watch, you're gonna literally watch something, whatever the mental life of a zebrafish larval is, you're gonna kind of watch it happening here for about 30 seconds. So this is a top view of the animal. So you're looking down on the brain. These are the optic lobes of the animal. And once I start this plane, this is, by the way, the result of, this is the work of Misha Ahrens and uh, Phil Keller and their colleagues at Janelia Farm, published last year in Nature Methods. And this is just a totally mesmerizing movie. I mean, you're seeing like the activity of a few thousand neurons or a few hundred neurons, and you can see some of them are firing together. See how some of them are going together? That means they're together in some network. Some of them are going opposite to each other. Here in a few minutes, you'll see this big flash, and I have no idea what happens in this big flash. There you go. What the hell was that? You know, is that a seizure? Is that, did somebody slam the door in the building? I mean, that's worth watching again. I mean, as a, as a systems neurophysiologist, I find, I find this mesmerizing because these are, these are data that we've never been able to get. And these guys can actually do different Z-planes through the fish and record from 80,000 of its 100,000 neurons slowly, not nearly fast enough yet, but they're gonna get a lot faster. They're gonna be a lot better. And here comes that big flash again that I don't, you know, I have no idea what this is all about. Maybe it was some traumatized memory of his, what his mother did to him when he was a child. I have, I have no idea. So look, there are some things right about this and some things wrong. They're not even wrong, they're just incomplete. So what's right about this? The, one of the things that's right about this is that we're away now from the single neuron, one at a time recording, trying to piece together the picture post hoc. We've got thousands of neurons we're, we're, we're recording simultaneously. And some neurophysiologists would tell you, ah, that's the holy grail. You know, if we can see every action potential from every neuron, then we're gonna understand the way this puppy works. Now, do you believe that from, from looking at this? No, I don't, I don't think so. But what's wrong? What more do you want to see? What's one of the first things that's missing here? It's behavior, right? There's no behavior here. I mean, if, if we want to know, is that animal trying to swim or something, and we want to know if that activity is related to some real behavior, we've got to free this animal up. We can't freeze him in agar. And there's ways to do that. You can do, just do agar around the head, and you can leave the tail free. You can loom visual stimuli, and you can watch these tail flicks as the animal tries to avoid the stimulus. And you can start relating some at least elementary kinds of behavior to patterns of firing up here. Uh, so that's one thing. And, and the second thing is slow. We're missing a lot of action potentials here. A third thing is that we don't know the connectivity of all these neurons. I mean, remember that big connectivity system of the visual system that I showed you really early in the talk? We don't know that circuitry for this thing. So somehow the dynamics of the activity and the deep circuitry are going to be related to each other and how they mediate behavior is going to be related to each other. But then even if we see the Carl, it's a behavior, we need a theory about how this thing has worked. How is visual information encoded in these neurons, right? What's, what's the population code? How do circuits of neurons generate movement? So we've got to have dynamics, we've got to have the anatomical connections, we've got to have the link to behavior, and we've got to have theory. And that's what we're talking about in this brain initiative, okay? Those things and more. This is what's going to come out, I think, over the next 10 years. 
And we're doing it at, at fine levels. I think we're going to be doing it as a field in fine levels in small animals. We're, going to be, we're not waiting for small animals to be finished before we go into humans. We're doing it at large levels, coarse levels in humans. And somehow these guys have got to meet in the middle. So, you know, the larval zebrafish is a cool prep, and I, I'm all for the little zebrafish. But ultimately, you know, I say, whose mental life interests you more? You know, is it the monkey's mental life or the zebrafish? Or is it people, people with Alzheimer's who are suffering, you know, behind the curtain of Alzheimer's? And I think the Brain Initiative seeks to understand nervous systems at all of these levels and understand natural nervous systems and how they compute in simple things like our context-sensitive decision-making, but ultimately so we know how these things work, where our mental life comes from, and how we can fix these things when we go wrong. So you've been a very patient audience, and I thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer a few questions. Thank you.